All right, welcome to my channel, guys. I've I recorded this video. I spent 25 minutes recording it, and I, it screwed up, and I'm doing it again. Freaking mad because it... Mm. All right, so here we are again. All right, disclaimer. I'm going to have a disclaimer. It's going to be like eight or nine minutes long, and then I'm going to put in the description how to click and skip the disclaimer. If you don't want to know why I'm talking about books, talking about programming books, if you don't want to know why my theory about books is why it is, then go ahead and hit the, the button and skip like five or eight minutes, whatever. All right, so first of all, disclaimer. What do I think about programming books? Programming books are a supplement. They are not the key ingredient, you know? My daughter right now is in middle school and they don't even have books anymore. Like. She'll bring home papers. I'm like, where are your books? She goes, I don't have books. I don't have books. I, we don't go on Google, which isn't good because I'm trying to figure out things on Google and they're, they don't match up. Anyway, books are not a primary way to learn. So my point is books are supplement. So why do I like, like books? I like books because when I'm traveling, I can, I can take this and I can uh, just re I like the look and feel. This is not my primary way to learn. So if I was going to learn something, what I would do is I would take a class. I would go to Udemy, I would go to YouTube, and I would start practicing. If I wanted to learn, for example, if I wanted to learn Python, I would go to YouTube and I would install an environment where I could play around. I would create functions, I would create variables, I would create, if I wanted to do a web, I wanted to learn PHP or ASP, I would create a website. I would make something and I would find a tutorial. And I would do, and I would do. For example, all day long at work today, my, me and my coworker are learning this new tool that takes documents in that are in EDI format. And it takes them and it changes them into XML or JSON. And it takes them and it maps them and it configures them and it stores them and it brings them all the way into SharePoint or document management system. It brings these documents in. So my point is, all day long, all we did was use the tool and we tried it and we tested it and we tried it and we tested it and that didn't work and that didn't work and we tested it and we tweaked it and we changed it and we eventually we got it to work, but we learned. The point is we learned. The whole process was about learning and it was about doing and learning. So all day long we learned, okay, by doing. Did we use a single book? No, we didn't use one single book. All we did was try and try and try and test. Okay, and there's hardly any information on it. That being said, books are still good. I still buy books, but they are very expensive. If you are a college student and you don't have much money and you want to learn, you can get everything you need on the internet. You can get almost every single thing you need from the internet, okay? You do not need to sp spend $40, $50, $80 a, for a book to learn. However, if you're a professional and you want to know more, that's where books come in. They become a supplement. I like to have the physical, I like to have the physical book in my hand. When I'm traveling, I, I go to my mom's house for Christmas, for example. I'm gonna close the door, I'm gonna turn on the lamp, and I might I might sit back and just start reading and be like, man, that's interesting. That's interesting. So that brings me to my my point. How do you justify spending fifty, sixty dollars for a hardback book? I almost think they're trying to phase books out by making them so expensive that you have to buy them on the Kindle and all. And that's why, by the way, that's why I collect all these books. So while we're here, let's take a look at most of these books. But I love books. I love them. I go to Goodwill and I go and look for classics. I look for things that stand the test of time. And a lot of these are philosophy. Some of them are mathematical. Anything that catches my interest, I will buy them because at Goodwill, they're like a dollar to three dollars each. Okay. Now, how do you justify spending $40, $50 a book? Now, in, in most cases, you can't. You cannot justify that. However, if you're a professional and you're interviewing and you're a contractor and you got to be on the top of your game, how do you justify spending so much money for a book? And the answer is when you ask yourself, what value would I get out of spending $50 for a book? And if it means the difference between getting a job and not getting a job, keeping a job and not keeping a job, then the answer is you buy the book 
because one, if you earn $50 an hour, $60 an hour, $40 an hour, how long does it take you to earn? How long does it take you to earn this book? One, two hours? If you, if you get the job and you don't, think about it. Do the math. In one day, in one hour, you can pay for this book if you get the job. Where you could be out of work for three, four, eight weeks and, and not get the job because you did, decided not to buy the book. My point is, if you learn anything, if you buy a book and you spend $40 and you learn one thing, five things, seven things that you can use in your job or in an interview that pay for the book because you got the job, then the answer is you buy the book. In most cases, I would say, if I'm interested, it's going to help my career. Don't even hesitate. I'm a programmer. I buy the book. Can you get every single thing of this pretty much on the internet? Yes. But do I like to hold a book like this and read it? And that being said, that's my disclaimer. That's how I, cho that's how I choose whether or not I buy the book. Does it help my career? Will I learn something? Will I read the book? Really? Oh. Are you really going to read this book? That's another question. Are you really going to read it? Are you going to spend $60 on a book and read it? If you are, the answer is yes, buy the book. If you know you're not going to read it, you're going to be like, nah, don't buy the book. All right. All of that being said, now, now I have to add one more thing. Just because you see these books, that doesn't mean they apply to you. These books apply to me, my career, and my interests. Your big book list is going to be different than mine, Okay. So just because you see these, that doesn't mean you run out and buy them. That means because I bought these books because they're relevant to me and I thought they would help me. That doesn't mean they're going to help you. If your career path is in a different trajectory than mine, then don't buy these books. Go buy different ones. All right. Let's go ahead and start with Amazon Web Services Certified Solutions Architect. Okay, why did I buy this book? There was a time when... I was at this company three years ago, roughly two years ago, roughly, and we wanted to learn AWS. We knew it was good. We knew it was going to help our career. And I knew these other guys that were going to get certified. People were getting certified, right? And it looks good on your resume. You want to learn it. But we weren't quite sure. So I went and I started studying it. I, I signed up from, for an AWS account. I started creating machine images. I started creating machines. I created a Linux. I created a, I even did a, a Litecoin mining machine and I put my credit card in and I was learning and I, and then I, I'm like, I'm going to go pass that test. So I went and bought this book as a supplement because what did I want? I wanted test questions, test questions, right? I had a very specific need for buying this book. This is going to prepare me for the test. So I got this and I got this for a very specific reason. I wanted to pass the test. This had practice questions, very focused. I knew what I wanted, buy it. And by the way, the next job I have right now, guess what we're learning? Guess what I have to know? AWS. Everything I did is still related. It's still related and I'm using it. So all of it was relevant, okay? Okay, moving on. All right, so my career has mostly been the core of my career has been C sharp. Now it's all, everything else has been periphery, but the core of my career has been C sharp. Now think about this book. Are you really going to read this cover to cover? If you are, I have to question your, your priorities. I have to question the time. 1060 pages. Now, are you going to read this book cover to cover? Probably not. Are you going to learn something when you read this? Yes. And when I got this, this is the C Sharp 7. This is the most up-to-date book that there is. And so it, it has things right off the bat. I started reading the first chapter. It has things in C Sharp that have been added that I've, I didn't even know. Okay. I, I consider myself an expert. But there are things in here that are brand new. They are short. They're kind of like shortcuts. And I'm putting them in my uh, C Sharp Nuggets. But so this book, the reason I would get something like this and spend, by the way, guess how much it cost? 
Now it says $74.99 right there, okay? I don't think I paid that. I think I paid $49 for it, brand new. But then again, think about it. This is my career we're talking about. If I learn one thing from this, or five things, or 10 or 20, which I have, if I can apply those to my job, keep my job and make myself relevant, the, the answer is at 40, 50, $60 an hour when you're working, do you buy a $50 book when you make $50 an hour? Yes, of course you do. Because it's just one, it takes one hour to earn this back after taxes and all that stuff. So the question is, how much money are you making? How, how, how much are you willing to learn? I didn't even hesitate. When I bought this book, I'm like, it's part of my career. I'm going to buy it. And I learned and I'm getting better as a programmer. So I bought this freaking book. Am I going to read it to cover to cover to cover? No. Am I going to take it and put it in my hands and skim through it and learn stuff? Yes. All right, let's talk about Goodwill. A lot of the books I bought that you see in the back, I have a library. I love books, just so you know. I, they're not the best way to learn programming, but I still love books. They're a great way to learn. Let's take, for example, what's in my library, okay? So I go to, I go to used bookstores, and I go to Goodwills, and I, just, I skim. And I'm like, if it looks interesting at all, or if it's a classic, if I know it's a classic and I want it, I put it in my library because it's so cheap. It's one to three or $4 at Goodwill, or sometimes as much as 70 cents if it's a paperback. And I put it in my library. I have a lot more books than this, by the way. I have some upstairs. Um, let's just take a look. Okay, I just grabbed some books just behind me. What the heck's in here? In my library, I love having a library because whenever I feel like reading, I just grab it, okay. Dostoevsky, House of the Dead, classic book. I've read, I've read half of that. Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. You want to be well-rounded. You don't just want to be a programmer, right? You want to have a real education. I literally have a college education behind me right there. Nostradamus. I was like, who is this guy? Why is he, who is he? I read the book. Bill Bryson, he's interesting, uh, travel writer. Um, what else can I say? Leaves of Grass. I heard this is the most famous po poem book in the world, so I got it. So that's how I choose my books. I have, I have tons of them, and I will g make a video of them if you're interested. All right, so talking about Goodwill. You're going to go through Goodwill, and you're going to find books, and most of them are going to be out of, if you're a programmer, they're going to be out of date or irre irrelevant. You're going to see VB6 books. You're going to see Windows uh, Vista, Vista books. <laughs> like, no, you're not going to buy those. But you might see a C++ book, right? You might see... You might see a C++ book. You might see a Linux book. Guess what? Those books are timeless because they don't change that much. C++ hasn't changed. It might have some new features and stuff, but... If you're going to learn a programming language, go to Goodwill. Get a C++ book. C++ is the basis of all C languages. You learn this, you will know everything. You will know the core. You know what I'm saying. So a book like this you can get for probably $3, $4. Go on Amazon. Right now you can get this used probably for less than $10. Start reading it. These are the kinds of books that if you are a poor a college student, you buy something like this. You get your core down, but you don't run out and buy this for $50. You buy the other one for five. Linux. All right, I have a whole thing about Linux. I love Linux. I think it's very, at its core, it's it's a great way to learn the, the very, very, very core of how software interacts with hardware. And I've always been interested in Linux and the, and the, the freeware, the the open source nature of it. You can get a Linux book, a Unix book at a Goodwill or something like that, and it'll be dirt cheap and it will be timeless. And I, what I mean by that is that Linux and Unix and things like that don't change that much. They're very, very basic and core. They're not, they're not always coming out with a new U Linux and Unix. Yeah, there's different flavors. Of course there are, but if you get your basic Linux and Unix, you're going to understand how those work in that in that world. And eventually your career is going to guess what I'm doing right now. I'm a I'm a windows.net developer. Guess what we're using? Amazon web services and Linux servers on Amazon. Do you need to know Linux as a Windows programmer? 
yes. Is Linux that hard? No. Play with it. It's fun. Build a machine. Learn it. Install it. It's great. Okay. We're going to move on to... All right. In your programming career, you're going to go beyond programming, and you're going to go into architecture, and you're going to see many architectures. And at some point, you're going to want to become maybe an architect or a team lead. I went out and bought design patterns because I know design patterns. I've seen a lot of them, but can I really talk about them? Can I really explain them in an interview? Can I diagram them in, a, in an interview? Not really. So I got this book to understand better how to design software systems. I know how to design them, but do I know all, all the nomenclature? Do I know all the verbiage? Do I know how to explain it? Can I get through in an interview? And so I bought this book, hardback book, very expensive, $49.95. But again, if you want to get to the next level and learn architecture, something like a design pattern book, what is it? What is in here? Like abstract factory. These are patterns, different ways to program and create architectures. Builder, factory method, bridge, composite, facade. Can you speak to those? If you're asked in an interview, do you know what a facade pattern is? Have you used a factory pattern? Do you know what dependency injection is? It's beyond programming. It's architecture. And a book like this, is it's, there's a reason why I got this. It's because it's the next level. And I know the next level, but can I talk about it? No, I can't. I can't. I couldn't give a demonstration. I couldn't give an overview. I couldn't pass an interview. So I got that. All right. <sighs> it, speaking of interviews and architecture, cracking the coding interview. Now, I've had dozens of interviews, and I've, I've gone through them. But what's the next level? Could I get through a Google or an Amazon interview? Probably not. Because, like I said, do I know my patterns? Can I talk on them? Probably not. So I got this book based on the reviews and what I thought. I, I looked through it and I thought it was good. I spent the money. It is, it was probably $50. Most of these books are very expensive. They're going to try to discourage you from buying the hardback. But I really love, that's another reason why I collect my classics back there is because I think more and more they're going to go away. And I just love to have the feeling. And I think these are going to be worth more and more as we go in the future because everything is becoming digital. Anyway, I haven't read much of this. It's cracking the coding interview. I think it's it's got great reviews. It's a, it's not a beginner book. It's not a beginner book. It's going to be pretty advanced and even I'm going to have trouble understanding. It. I'm going to have to read it a few times. All right. So, now that's the core of the books that I bought in the last probably two years that it's, they're kind of on my shelf. I kind of skim them when I feel like it. Let's move into the fun things, okay? If you've finished this video and you've got your idea, and I'm going to say this is pretty much the end of the video unless you want to stick around. Okay, so I've talked about this book before, and I'm not saying it's a good book, but if you want to know kind of the state of the world today and where things are going. It's not a technical book. It's more of an organizational book. And it talks about how Uber and Facebook and Amazon are changing the way that we're doing things, okay? And how companies are becoming more and more dependent on infrastructure of the, their technology and information and less dependent on the old ways of doing things. Does that make sense? If not, if you don't understand that, you need to read this book. Do not spend a lot of money for this book. You should be able to get it for used, very cheap. And to be honest, it kind of pisses me off because it's very, it's kind of misleading. You need to know what's going on, but it's misleading. All right. Now, one of my favorite books of all time, all time, it's kind of a philosophy book, philosophical book. And it has to do with the movie The Matrix. So in the idea was the matrix was built off of this book. So the uh, what I've read was or heard that the matrix movies were based off of this book. However, this guy Jean Baudrillard would tell you that 
he he wouldn't exactly agree with the fact that they made these movies from his book because his book and the movies were quite a departure from each other. In fact, I think he said, he actually said, The Matrix, talking about the movies, are exactly the kinds of movies that The Matrix would make about itself. Does that make sense? He's kind of saying, he watched The Matrix and he said, that's exactly what you would expect from the fake world that we live in today. Okay, now I haven't read this book in over a year and a half or two years, so I'm, I'm kind of rusty on how it is. Um, he's a French philosopher, the most interesting, but one of my favorite books ever. I actually have highlighted, I read, I read through this and highlighted the pages. And it's very hard to read because you have to read the same sentence over and over again and really try to think like, what? He, he speaks in kind of a weird sort of language, but basically what he says is that we have, we have reality, and over time, reality becomes replaced by a symbol. There's reality and it becomes replaced by a symbol. So, for example, we had Christmas, right? We had, we had Christmas, we had presents, we had trees, we have a memory. And then the movie comes along, like a Christmas story, that represents Christmas, but it does it in such a way that's almost better than the original Christmas we, we remember. It's bizarre because the original Christmas that we remember, it had its flaws, right? It had its problems, but we, we want to think about it like it's this beautiful thing. But if you watch a Christmas story, it's a beautiful story about Christmas that's, that's it's extraction from reality that's not even real and then the next level there's no new levels of reality and the next level is another extraction where maybe it's an image of the christmas story and you have this image it becomes more and more fake and that christmas doesn't even exist anymore all it is is movies and so he he talks about all these things and how things that they used to be real and then there's a representation and then there's another level of representation and now now you've lost all touch re with reality. It's so bizarre to think about that we live in this world of symbols and non-reality called, well, he would call it simulacra and simulation. Uh, and, another, and another level would be, he said something along the lines of museums. Museums are destroy. They actually destroy the culture that they, they're supposed to represent. So if you have a museum of maybe like the mound builder, builders, Indians, you know, the, the Indians that built mounds, and you have a museum and you walk into the museum and there they are in the clay, they're in the statues and they have the fires and they, they separate reality into this fake, fake ass museum. And you, that becomes your reality, right? But the museum is not real. It's like, it's not even close to reality. And they've basically destroyed what was... Re it's so bizarre. Anyway, read the book if you're interested. I'm rambling.